whatever works. Yeah, it, it works better for them. Yeah. If we were live streaming, it'd be bothers you enough, please, feel, there are some seats up front. Um, I have a limited number of sheets. Um, I'm going to get, I'm going to drive you up on the front row. Right? You can get to serve if you're on the front row. Um, got us a very interesting situation here. I typically don't preach with notes. I typically teach Bible class with notes. And I have notes. But I'm 52 years old, and here they are. Um, I, and this is as big as I can make them, so I'm keeping one of these sheets so that I can kind of figure out where we're going. Um, we're looking at the idea of being complete with Christ, and um, there's a whole lot that's involved with that. Uh, we walked through the uh, particular passage. Of the book of Colossians and have seen that. I'm gonna just wait a minute, okay? Because I just I can't. I don't have the projection power. Right now. Okay, I think that's a little bit more of a lull. Um, it seems to me as we walk through the letter, there is a different component involved in. Um, being made complete in Christ. That's, as we've already established very well, is the purpose of the, the letter to the Colossians. Um, and it's interesting how Paul in chapter 1 exalts Christ and who He is. And through that tells us there's no one else like Him. And as the result of that, we can be made complete in Him. We looked at the idea of uh, what we do uh, with Him, what we have in Him, and what happens through Him. And that's the, the section that precedes this one. Um, how the Apostle Paul uh, sets up, if you'll notice in the introduction there, the choice that we have uh, is a choice between Christ and these false teachers, between His doctrine and between what these Judaizers, or these unnamed, this Colossian heresy that looks a lot, I say, it's kind of a Freudian slip to say Judaizers, it looks a lot like the problem that Paul deals with in the book of Galatians, what they're doing is they're teaching the law and saying that there are requirements that you've got to have in addition to what Christ requires, and that's a big problem. And the magnitude of that problem, no matter how it shows itself, whether it's trying to tack the Old Testament onto the New Testament, or whether it's trying to be legalistic in any way and tack more requirements onto the, to the will of Christ than Christ does, you're going to have kind of the same effect. But the choice in verse 16 through 23 sets up as a, a, in a very unusual way. The choice is to either die with Christ or to live in the world. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind. That's really, uh, and, and, and by the way, the, the choice is not whether or not to die in Christ. Any, anybody tell me what the difference is in dying with Christ and dying in Christ? What does it mean to die in Christ? For example, in Revelation 14 and verse 13, uh, John says, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. What is John conveying there in Revelation 14 13? People who uh, are believers in Christians and they have physically died in that same state. Okay, and there, there's the hub of it. He's talking about those who have, have walked the road of Christ. They have come into Christ. 
they have, they have already done the dying with Christ. And as a result of this, they have lived in such a way that when they die physically, they now get to go and to be with Christ. Okay? Now, so then, that being said, what does the Apostle Paul mean? You can go back a few verses. What does he mean when he says that you have died with Christ? What's the idea? That's baptism. Okay, you're buried with Him in baptism. So, think with me with the metaphor, and I, and I watched most of Hiram's class. What does it mean? How does, how does Paul set that up, this idea of dying with Christ? What little symbol does he use? What about the old man, the new man, and being born again? Yes. That's one thing. All right. And that's the theme, not, certainly not just of Colossians, but the New Testament. But what were these uh, unnamed teachers? What were, they, what were they telling these Colossians they had to do? So, yeah, be circumcised. All right. And, and I think we made the point. Was the point made that the circumcision, the literal circumcision that these guys were pushing, involved just a part? But what is what is true spiritual circumcision? It is of the heart that's often used. So the heart is the seat of the person. And so it represents all of who a person is. And so the true spiritual circumcision in Christ does not involve, just for the sake of the argument, a, a part. It involves everything. And so what he's saying is, is that all of you your heart at the center of it all, but all of who you are has died with Christ. And that's when he switches to the burial illustration in the last part of the last paragraph. First, it's he's taking their circumcision illustration. He's saying they want you to circumcise just a part, but to be truly circumcised, all of you has got to die. It's got to be cut off. It's got to be, as Derek says, the old man, new man analogy there. You put off the old man. You've put on the new man. You've got to die with Christ and be raised with Him as He was raised and then live so that when you physically die, you get to be in the Lord. Alright, so that's the choice that we have. So let's go to Colossians chapter 2 and let's look at what the Apostle Paul says. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. He says, Therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink in, or in respect to the festival or new moon or Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. By the way, I have it as a footnote there. You may have it in your version uh, for substance. What do you have? Anybody have something different? Anybody have a marginal rendering for substance? Body. Body. What, what version is that? New, New King James Version. Okay, so then a lot of you, instead of seeing substance, saw body there. Yeah, it's just listed as a record. Okay, so um, I want you to keep in mind, normally when we think about the body of Christ, what are we thinking about? The church. The church. Keep in mind, that's not what he's the, the body reference is to here. And context helps us to see that, alright? So the substance, the body, belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement or the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions that he's seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from the, uh, whom the entire body... Now, there, that body is talking about the church. The entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use. In accordance with the commandments and teachings of men, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. If one side of the choice is dying with Christ, what's the other choice? Paul identifies it in verse 20. Living in the world. Living in the world. It's interesting that this is a choice that is set uh, forward by a lot of the New Testament writers. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, there is a contrast between suffering now and having the uh, eternal reward that comes by faith, 1 Peter 1, 7. Or you can choose not to be persecuted for your faith, conform to this world, 
and at the end lose that reward that is promised to the faithful. Really, that's Christianity 101. But it's necessary to this particular audience because they're being told by some unnamed group with some beliefs that can kind of help us peg what they're all about. But they're, they're there saying that you've got... And, and so we get to the question of why would, why would doing these extra things in addition to what Christ taught why would that be something easier and more appealing than just what Jesus has given? Why would extra requirements be easier to follow than just what Jesus had taught them? Because we're, we're faced with a dilemma. Are these just some of the most gullible, crazy people that they would prefer more than what Christ says? Or would there be some cultural reason why it would be more attractive to do so? Assuming that there's a reason that Paul wrote this, we'd have to assume that the latter's the case. How? Would you think it would be easier to follow more than what Scripture said? But let's think about it. He says, Why as though living in the world if you live according to these ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are the parish with using. What would be the benefit of this? Give more attention. It looks like you're working harder to do something. Okay, so we have some religious friends who, as a part of their teaching, win people by that um, um, very works based uh, faith that say they've got to go and knock on so many doors, right? And they've got to. To touch, make contact with so many people, they need to every night of the week. They need to go out, and they and, and it appeals to because those religions are growing religions. They're not shrinking religions. There's a world religion that, as as a part of what it teaches, very much lowers the status of a woman, right? And and you you wonder a lot of times what is in it for her. But a lot of women are converted to Islam. So it could be that that's appealing to some people by having extra requirements they want to do that. Would there be any other reasons why somebody would find that more appealing? Um, people often will put up hedges. Um, and I think Paul kind of gets at that at the end where he talks about how these things are no value against the indulgence of the flesh because sometimes people think they are. You put up these extra rules to keep you further away from the sin and, and you think it's helping you to not sin but it's not really. Okay. All right. And that's uh, time permitting, that's, that's kind of where we get to at the, at the very end of this. That's a great point. Um, if you didn't hear, this, this kind of a religion has the appearance that it's, it's actually, if you go further than the Lord says to go, then aren't you going to be safer? You know, if, if the Lord says, here's the lion um, and, and here's the, uh, the, the canyon, let's go over here. Let's build a fence over here because if you build a fence here, then you don't have to worry about going past this and falling off the cliff. What's wrong with that? It's not where the Lord put it. <laughs> we do see this this fault, right? We see the fault of putting the fence closer or over on top of the cliff. The problem with that, what's the problem? Still We're going to die. What's the problem with this one? Established by man. I mean, a lot of those rules are established by man. Okay. I mean, but they, but they keep us safer. And you're not getting to the people who are close. Uh, you're, part of our job is to save those who are close to the cliff. So we're not going close to the cliff either. Okay. We're supposed to be. We're supposed to be taking the word to the to the rest of the world. We're ignoring all those people over there because, like, we can't even go over there. Okay. So I, I see. Kind of what I was you circle the wagons, and we just protect what ourselves. I was meaning too was the, uh, talking about it, those rules would be reliant on man's rules and not reliant. God's presence and power in your life. That's We've changed our standard of authority. No matter how good this person is, no matter how, how much we look up to them, it's still not Christ's rules. Here is a fundamental fact that we have always got to keep at the forefront of our mind. You cannot make being a Christian harder than Jesus makes it. Now, if you think that doesn't challenge you, then you're not thinking as deeply as you should about your, your faith. Let me ask you, do you have scruples? Do you have things that you feel very strongly about? 
I'm going to confess to you because I'm up here at the front. I imagine I have some scruples and convictions on a few matters that maybe is, goes beyond what some other people do uh, in some areas uh, if, as, it, as it relates to tobacco, as it relates to modesty. Um, and I have very strong feelings. Now, you know, in, in some of those areas, there are some there's some er there's some, what we can say there are things that are definitely wrong there are things that are definitely right and there are some things that are matters of judgment where we've got to come to uh, a conclusion based on our study of the Bible but what we cannot do I can't put my scruples and my convictions as a fence and say you better stay on on the side that I've drawn if my fence is not where the Lord's is now Yours may not be those particular issues. And I just picked a couple off the top of my head. Not that I'm just full of scruples, but some people say, I don't have any scruples at all. But you know, we all have things that we feel very strongly about. You may feel very strongly that we should or should not do something. But be, be careful. Make sure that it's, it's rooted in what Christ has said and not what man has said. Yes, sir. It's a reminder, I think, of God's power and grace being what saves us and not our own rules. That's right. And there's nothing that we, there's no rules that we can make that's going to save us or get us any closer to God. So it's only through His power and His grace that we're able to be saved. Absolutely, absolutely. And and that that's the thing. If He has rules about X, Y, or Z, they're not negotiable. We can't we can't just turn those loose and do what we want to do. But it. But we also understand that we're trying to navigate through a lot of things that are that are not clearly spelled out for us, and that being the case, we've got to certainly accept His grace. But we've also got to give each other grace in regard to that. Okay, so that's the good thing. I've gone over this lesson several times, so I'm I'm actually picking something from point two here, point three there. And we're putting it all forward. Um, I do want to kind of walk you through this choice. The choice is dying with Christ and living in the world. And that choice uh, can be divided into at least three things. All right? And the, uh, the first one uh, that he gives us is it's a choice between shadow and substance. Go back to look at verse 16 and 17. He says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to festival or new moon or Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what uh, is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All right, so they set themselves up as judges. Didn't they? Isn't that what he's saying here? What do they make themselves judges of? Food and drink, festivals and new moons and Sabbaths. All right. Traditions. Other people. I think we could say that they set themselves judges, um, set themselves up as judges, but what they wanted to judge was unimportant because it was just what you said. It was what people think. It was traditions. They had no right. And the way that they judged was unfair. They, they, they had themselves as the judge of every detail of your life. Isn't it interesting how Paul picks out three things? What, what do you notice about those three things in uh, verse 16? Food. Uh, after, after the food and drink, let's go to, or, or when he gets it after that, in respect to a festival. What's a festival? What does it seem to be? All right, so if this is a Jewish audience, and I believe that it is, at least that he's talking about here, or a Jewish doctrine, what would be the festival days? Like what? Passover. Passover. Pentecost, Pentecost uh, Tabernacles. Alright, so that's the three. That's the three high and holy days. We could throw in a, a but, but all those holidays have what in common, typically? How often do they occur? Once a year. Once a year. Alright, how about a new moon? How often does that happen? Once a month. Once a month. That's, how, that's even what it means. Or what about Sabbath days? How often does that happen? Every week. Every week. So I'm going to dictate down to the week and the month and the year of how you are to practice your Christianity. That's what they were doing. They were saying, I'm going to get into every bit of your life and I'm going to uh, provide my rules. Now, what Paul says is, is what they're offering is an inferior product. 
Well, how does he describe what they are trying to set up? What does he call it? It's a shadow. So what is a shadow? Say it again. Oh, it follows you. Okay, it does follow you, but from a scientific standpoint, what what is a shadow? It's, it's just the light the source being blocked by an object. Blocked by the light. Okay, the light's being blocked by that object. So is the shadow the substance? Yeah. No, there's a difference. He's saying what they're trying to peddle you is the shadow. It's not the real thing. What's the real thing? And by the way, what's the body? The body's Christ. And the body here is the body of teaching. It's His doctrine. Here's what Christ says. That's the substance. What they're trying to push on you is the shadow. The shadow don't, it, uh, ain't, ain't adequate, I think is the theological way to say that. And so you've got to have the substance. You've got to have Christ's teaching. you already got it. And then, uh, just for the sake of time, number two, it's defrauding versus developing. Verse 18 and 19. All right. So, they made themselves referees, umpires. Um, how many of you ever, any of you ever officiated games? Any kind of sport? Okay, don't you love that? Isn't that fun? Everybody, everybody else in the stadium or in the, in the stands, whatever it is, they know better than you do, even though you're inches away from it. I have to say, they get an unfair shake, but do they sometimes get it wrong? I'll show my age. Any of you baseball fans? Remember what happened to Jorge Orta, uh, George Orta? He was, he was called safe in the 1985. Of course, I know some of you were not born for much after 1985. <laughs> he was not safe. Um, or Colorado football, even before I ever moved to Colorado. I remember Colorado versus Missouri, the famous fifth down, where the officials completely blew it. And they gave him a fifth down, and they scored on that one on to win the national championship. Um, I mean, there's, I can give a whole bunch more. You can think of your own. There was when they had the replacement officials in the, the Jets game and the guy caught the touchdown that was not a touchdown. It's happened forever. Point is, there is no referee, no matter how good they are, no matter how elite they are in what they do, they're just going to get it right every time. And what Paul says is, is these folks have set themselves up as uh, umpires, referees. And there's some problems with it. Notice, they made themselves uh, referees by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. Don't get caught up in what that means. It meant whatever it meant as a part of this Colossian uh, heresy. But what he's, what he's saying in, in that is, is that it's not Christ. It's something that they have tacked on to it. And so they can't judge you based on the activity of angels. It's, it's not acceptable. Number two, uh, by taking his stand on visions that he has seen, verse 18, this is a false claim of authority, and this is something that happens today. When, when somebody tries to, um, to say, hey, I know this is right because God spoke to me. God told me. Uh, and you've heard that whole story, right, about the, there was a debate between those two guys and the guy uh, got up and tried to take over the service and he said, you know, God spoke to me and told me to address this audience. And the gospel preacher was sitting on the front pew and he said, hey, what time was that? 4.30? That explains it. God spoke to me at five and told you to be quiet and listen to what I have to say. <laughs> what's, what's, see, that's, that's how you play that game, right? How do I know God spoke to you and, or if God's spoken to me? Or, or if I want to try to push something, the Spirit is, is leading me to this direction. How do I know that's a false claim? How can I know that's always a false claim if what somebody is saying is not saying that what the Spirit guided His uh, inspired men to write? How can I know that He's not, that that's not right? And I know that's not right. Is it possible that God spoke to you with a direct revelation and gave you a message that needs to be told to the world? I mean, that's a yes or no question. Which is it? No. Why is it no? I could go with 1 Corinthians 13 on that. Prophecies have ceased. Okay. Prophecies have ceased. Um, One way you can really know is if this Spirit is leading them somewhere the Bible doesn't say it. You know? Okay, so often that's what happened. In fact, anytime that's ever been said to me personally, the Spirit is, is, is among us and is moving us to re examine X, Y, or Z. But the Spirit's already on record having a different position. That's going to be, see, this is the kind of thing that the, the Colossian heresy was producing. It was people with a, a false claim of authority saying, God, I'm, I'm moved, I've got visions. 
that have led me to this conclusion. Number three, by being inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. This would have been human logic and reason. I, I have come to this conclusion. Um, how do you know it's not right? If it conflicts with what Christ has already been taught to have said. Number four, by not holding fast to the head. Their teaching was not from Christ. It was separate. Alright, so let me just give you the last point. Um, number three is it's, the, it's a choice between perishing and what is priceless. And that's where he talks about dying with Christ and living with the world. There's some things that um, are good to look at, but uh, go and study it and uh, be benefited from it. Thank you very much for your attention today. And we'll see you this evening. favorite example of, uh, of direct revelation, Paul Roberts, when he told everybody that God said that if you don't give me X amount of money, he's going to take me home. If people didn't give him that money, he still didn't take him home. I don't know if he's still with us now, but he's, like, he's dead now. He stayed a lot longer than that. He said he needed that money for a jet. Hold on, make sure I got it.